So again, good afternoon. Um, my name is Jill O'Donnell. I am the director of the Clayton Yeider Institute of International Trade and Finance here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you today to this very special event celebrating the release of the book, Rhymes with Fighter, Clayton Yeider, American Statesman, which was written by Joe Weber of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and published by the University of Nebraska Press. I want to especially welcome those members of the Yeider family who are here today, um, as well as those who are tuning in from afar. And I'd also like to recognize State Senator Luann Linehan, who has joined us, um, and also the university leaders present whose ongoing support of the Yeider Institute has been instrumental and much appreciated. And those are Chancellor Ronnie Green, um, I believe Mike Baim, the INR Vice Chancellor, is planning to be here as well, um, as well as Senior Associate Vice Chancellor Ron Yoder, Dean Richard Moberly of the College of Law, Dean Kathy Farrell of the College of Business, and um, Dean Tiffany Hang Moss, who is um, Dean of the College of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources, couldn't be here today, but she's also been very instrumental in the Geider Institute as well. Um, <clears throat> the Geider Institute was Clayton Geider's vision. He wanted to establish an organization that would bring together faculty from different disciplines related to trade in order to prepare students to do what he did, which was to lead in a time of very complex and rapid change in the global economy. He envisioned three distinguished faculty chairs in three different colleges who would work together. And we have that full team in place now that I want to acknowledge briefly. We have John Began in agricultural economics who is here, as well as Edward Balistrieri in economics and Matthew Schaefer in the College of Law. And we also have Assistant Director J.C. Toman, who's also a very important member of the Yeider Institute team. Since I began as the first director of the Yeider Institute a little over three years ago, I have talked with people all over Nebraska, the United States, and the world who knew Clayton. And from those conversations, two things always stand out. First, everyone remembers exactly when and where they met Clayton Yeider even if it was only one time, and even if it was decades ago. He instantly garnered tremendous respect because he cared about what people had to say. And second, everyone remarks on the tremendous foresight that he had about the international trading system. He saw where policy needed to go long before most others did, and everyone learned from him. That foresight extended to how students should be prepared for a changing world, in 1989, when Clayton Yeider was Secretary of Agriculture, he told an audience of students at Kansas State University, quote, that the world is changing more rapidly than ever before, and you are going to have to adjust to that. He went on to say, if you are prepared to be broad and creative and global in your thinking, you should have a very productive and rewarding career indeed. To speak of rapid change and the need for students to be global in their thinking in 1989 was ahead of the curve. Clayton's foresight continues to guide us today as we work to fulfill his vision in the Yeider Institute. We are doing that in several ways, including developing new courses, a new minor in international trade, special internship opportunities, and a new professional development program called Yeider Student Fellows. And some of those student fellows are here with us today. And we now have Clayton's story, the story of a great American public servant and statesman for everyone to read. Joe Weber has done a masterful job telling that story. And so to begin our program this afternoon, I would like to invite to the stage Ronnie Green, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and a longtime friend of Clayton Yeider's. Well, thank you, Jill. It's great to see everyone here at the Sheldon Museum today, especially members of the Yeider family, Christy, um, Brad, you know, Clayton's daughters who are here with us as well, to celebrate, as Jill has said, the publication now in print in real hard copy. Joe, I've been carrying around the eight and a half by 11 version of, of uh, pre-copy as I've been reading it, uh, this wonderful book that details the life of this giant in America. You know, I, I did not have the pleasure of getting to know Clayton early in my life. I had the pleasure of getting to know him later. I really got to know him well after I came back to the University of Nebraska in 2010 and came here as the Vice Chancellor of the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources. And one of the very first people that I heard from 
in that venture was Clayton Yider. And he contacted me, wanted to know who I was, more about me, wanted to know what I did to deserve this job, <laughs> number one. But, but I had the opportunity to get to know this giant who I had heard about through my career from his service in so many different ways, not just here in Nebraska, not just in the USDA early in his career during the Nixon years and the Ford years, but as Secretary of Agriculture, we know, as he went on to become, as U.S. Trade Representative, as the person who helped to form the World Trade Organization kind of mechanics as we know it today, the person who helped form the origination of the Canada and Mexico and U.S. free trade arena, uh, the person who went on to become the Republican national chairman of the Republican Party, uh, this giant really from Eustis, Nebraska, place that he was very proud of, very proud to be from. Uh, in western Nebraska, uh, Clayton would have been 91 this year. Uh, we all remember well the loss of him. I remember it acutely. Um, we were in the planning process for finishing the establishment of this institute and the vision for this institute that we had started working on, I think, Christy, in about 2011, you know, when I became engaged with that with Clayton. And this vision, as Jill was talking about a moment ago, of bringing together expertise across disciplines, bringing together expertise from the fields he had been part of, you know, initially, from agriculture, certainly, and from economics, from business, from law and bringing those together around this area of international trade and free trade <clears throat> and finance. As you'll well remember, Christy kind of insisted on that, if I remember right, in that vision for helping equip young people, equip students to be able to enter this world and that arena. You know, in 2016, when I became chancellor here, there was no one more excited about that than Clayton Yoder. And he, he mentored me, he encouraged me in a way of thinking about how to go into that leadership role. Little did I know until I'm reading, I think, chapter six, if I'm remembering right, of Joe's book that is being debuted today, how many university presidencies Clayton had been offered the opportunity to lead in his life, including this one, on multiple occasions during his career. And he took it upon himself to mentor me and to help me think about how to be a leader as well, not just in agriculture, but in this position as well. In 2016, when I took the role, we were very close to fulfilling the funding vision for how the Yider Institute would be brought to the fore. We had had the goal of trying to raise $8 million to underwrite endowment support for this institute to be formed that would not only bring to, to into place three endowed chairs, Jill mentioned those three endowed chairs and now the holders of those chairs in each of the colleges of business, College of Law and College of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources, but also to support programming, to support communication, to support student fellows, to support faculty fellows, to support a CME symposium that has now come into, into play as, as well. And as you all remember, many of you will remember, Clayton had been battling cancer by that point in time for several years and had gone through several rounds of treatment for cancer. He was always Going, there was just no doubt he was going to beat it and that it was going to, to be a challenge that he could meet. I was serving on a board with him at the time, the Neogen board that I'm still serving on and Clayton was, we were seeing that challenge play out in his life and we lost him. You know, I became chancellor in May of 2016 and as you'll remember, uh, Clayton passed early in 2017 and one of the greatest things that I will remember in my life 
was asking Clayton if he would be the keynote speaker at my investiture and installation here at the university as chancellor. We were so, so very lucky that he agreed to do that and he agreed to record it. And he, we, we had our communications people go to your home, Christy, in Potomac, Maryland, and record his remarks that, um, that he gave for us virtually. You know, I think they were recorded just a few weeks before Clayton passed away. And we were able to hear those words of wisdom from him in that investiture. I still remember them, still remember them very well. I got on the plane the day after that investiture here and went to Washington to be part of the celebration of his life. Phyllis, you were there as well. A number of you were. And I was so honored, Christy, to be asked to sing at Clayton's funeral. I will never forget that. This giant of a person that I had the opportunity to honor in my small way um, in that, that way. So thank you for that, that privilege, Christy, and that honor part of your family. Now I want to introduce just very briefly before we, we invite Christy Yider to come and, and talk to us, uh, the, the chairs who Jill mentioned. First of all, Jill, thank you for your leadership, for coming and joining the Institute as the director two years ago, we, we were, or three years ago now, we're very pleased about that. JC, who is the daughter of one of my wife's classmates, this, talk, this is a Nebraska deal, daughter of one of my wife's UNL classmates, who is the assistant director now of the Institute. Uh, John Begging, would you please raise your hand? The holder of the Yanny chair in agriculture and agricultural economics. I think Mike Anney was planning to be here later today, so hopefully we'll get to see him. Um, then Ed Ballesteri, the holder of the uh, Ackley Chair, uh, very pleased about that in the College of Business. Uh, very happy to have Ed here. And most recently, Matt Schaefer, professor in the College of Law. These, these three must travel together. John, you, you, you seem to have added your into the mix here. So um, um, Matt uh, originally, had held for a number of years the Veronica Haggard and Charles Work Professorship, um, funded as part of the Yider Institute early on um, in the College of Law, and just recently has accepted the position as the Yider Chair, the initial Yider Chair in the College of Law. So thank you for your leadership and what all three of you are bringing to the Institute. It is so cool to stand here today, all those years later, and be debuting this wonderful work from Joe, who you know we selected, uh, Christy was part of that selection as well, to write this biography of Clayton. Uh, as you will see when you read it, I'm still two thirds of the way through Joe, I'm working on it a chunk at a time, and absorbing it all. Very detailed, comprehensive history of Clayton that tells this story so well over time, and I was so pleased to see, and I didn't find this until I was looking at it last night, Joe, at the very end are these notes about the Yider Institute. So I would draw your attention to them, page two, pages 295 to 301, <laughs> that tell the, the great story of how the Institute has built and developed to this stage. Joe, you've done a great job. Thanks to the University of Nebraska Press for publishing uh, this great work that will tell Clayton's story forever and ever. So give Joe a big round of applause. I know you'll get a chance to, to see that work. And lastly, to members of the Yider family, we are so honored to be able to hold Clayton's legacy and so honored to be able to, to recognize the contributions that he made. So honored he is one of our alums. Well, was one of our alums, not just once, but multiple times, as you know. And we look forward to great things to come for generations to come, Christy and the family, from the Yider Institute. With that, I give you Christy Yider, widow of Clayton Yider, who was part of this vision as well in helping us think about what the Institute could become to make a few remarks on behalf of the Yider family. Christy.
this is a really exciting day for all of us. Um, before I start, let me just take a minute and let you know which of the Yiders are here. Um, so we have, and the, if you guys want to just, is this, can you stand? So we have Clayton's son, Greg, if you want to wave, Greg, for everybody, because the masks make it hard. Um, son, Nick, daughter, Valerie, and wife, Jill, and they are in Omaha. And then we have son, Brad. Brad doesn't have to stand if he doesn't want to because he has a bad hip that he won't get fixed. Um, <laughs> More pressure, Brad. Um, Brad's wife, Deb, daughter, Haley. Um, Clayton's daughter, Kim, is here. Kim Bottomore. And, <clears throat> and then I have my three girls. We have stand-up girls. I have Olivia, Victoria, and Elena. <clears throat> um, so happy that this day finally has come. Um, Clayton and I actually talked for years about him maybe doing an autobiography or hiring someone to do a biography, and it just it just seemed massively daunting, I think, um, for to try to do that. Um, just if anybody who knew Clayton know the amount of time he would have put into it and the um, of the poor author who might have been hired who would have to deal. <laughs> Um, so ultimately decided it didn't make sense, but I always, in the back of my mind, wanted to um, get it done. Um, and I thought actually it would end up being a more objective piece if it was after he was gone. Um, so before he died, I asked him if he, because he was the only one who could be able to do this, was to indicate, to list out what he considered to be his major professional accomplishments. Because ultimately what the, wanted the biography to be was about his professional accomplishments. So he wrote for me six items, which I have around, still have, um, that were the six things that he considered to be his um, greatest um, professional accomplishments, and so I gave those to Joe, and those form the um, framework of the book, and then interspersed are all the uh, additional information and details that, um, that Joe researched. Um, and I'm really, really very grateful that the University of Nebraska Press saw the value in hiring Joe and in, and in publishing this book. Um, as part of the research, Joe will probably tell you later, he spent hours and hours going through all the material that Clayton donated to Love Library. Um, Clayton never threw away anything. So it was, it's embarrassing, actually. He sent hundreds of boxes to Love Library. He didn't go through them. He just boxed them up and sent them. Um, and it's letters and pictures and all the other things. But I mean, it's, it was like every letter he ever wrote and every letter he ever received. It wasn't he didn't call it at all. So we're talking letters about parking tickets. We're talking letters about, um, you know, kids. I mean, all kinds of stuff. It wasn't just professional things. So poor Joe. Um, so maybe when you in the Q and A, somebody can ask you how many hours you spent going through all that material, because I think it was probably eye opening. Um, I also think that Joe probably got a glimpse into the frugality that was Clayton Yider too. Um, uh, and I don't know if it's Katie Jones here today. She's the there she is. She gets the, the number one prize. She's the archivist with Love Library who got to go through all of that material and actually told me that she loves what she does. So I think we, it's like one of those professions. We're truly grateful that there's somebody who loves going through the just enormous volume of material that she did. Um, the book's title, Rhymes with Fighter, um, seems very fitting. Um, among other things, it was how President George H.W. Bush introduced Clayton, um, and it also has the added benefit of finally letting the world know how to pronounce our last name. <laughs> I'm sure that most people, when they go into government service, do so hoping that in some small way they can change the world. Um, I know I did. Um, and I'm really, the main thing that pleases me so much about this book is that it really is going to let people learn how Clayton truly did change the world, uh, and not just in some small way. Um, you'll hear more about that later when Darcy and Warren do a um, panel with Jill um, to talk about, because um, they both have worked with Clayton professionally. Um, but I wanted to share one example that I thought would resonate with this audience in particular here today. Um, I often hear Governor Ricketts, um, Nebraska Governor Ricketts, talk about the fact that Japan is Nebraska's number one beef importer. And that is directly attributable to Clayton and his team negotiating an agreement with Japan to open their beef market. I mean, tr I mean that just, for me, it's just, it's, it's totally cool and also amazing that a whole state's industry, uh, beef industry, can be, you can 
to connect the dots back to Clayton and his group, um, his team getting that um, deal done. Um, but it, so I'm going to conclude my remarks. I just want to thank um, Ronnie for helping prod the Nebraska press if needed, um, but that working with them on, on getting this done. I um, want to thank um, uh, Joe Weber for taking all the time to write it, Jill O'Donnell and the wonderful job she's doing with the um, Yider Institute, and for everyone else who helped to make this day a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. We're going to hear from Darcy Vetter and Warren Mayarama now. Um, as soon as they are with us here, they're zooming in from Washington, D.C. to join us. <clears throat> we'll just give the technology a moment and um, I'll go ahead and start saying a few words about our, our guests who will be joining us. It's Really my pleasure to introduce two people who are uniquely positioned to reflect on the impact of Clayton's achievements and where they might be leading us um, when it comes to international trade. Darcy Vetter and Warren Mayarama, as I said, are joining us virtually from Washington, DC. There's Warren, hi Warren, hi Darcy. Um, both Warren and Darcy um, are international trade experts themselves. They both knew Clayton very well. Um, both were interviewed for the book, and both are members of the Yider Institute Advisory Council also. Uh, Darcy Vetter grew up on a farm in central Nebraska and has held several leadership positions in agriculture and trade. Um, she served as the chief U.S. agricultural negotiator from 2014 to 2017, most recently. She was also the university's first diplomat in residence here in 2017, where she laid some important groundwork for the Yider Institute. Currently, she's the Vice Chair for Agriculture, Food, and Trade at Edelman, a global public relations consultancy. And Warren Mayurama is a partner at the Washington law firm of Hogan Lovells and worked there with Clayton for a number of years, as well as with him in government service before that. Warren has held very senior positions at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, the White House, and the U.S. International Trade Commission. He worked with Clayton for decades and was a close intellectual partner um, of Clayton's. After hearing from Warren and Darcy for a few minutes, we'll also have a chance for a few questions from the audience as well. Warren, I want to start with you. Welcome to both of you. You worked with Clayton for a very long time, both in and out of government. So tell us a little bit about what it was like to work alongside him and how that experience has led you to assess that he was truly a visionary when it came to the international trading system and, and in changing agriculture. Um, well, uh, thanks. Uh, Jill, it's a great honor uh, to be here today. Uh, Clayton was my boss at USTR and the Bush 41 White House staff. He was a mentor, a colleague uh, for two decades at Hogan Lovells, and a friend. And I, uh, every day, miss, miss his advice and counsel. This institute was a dream of Clayton's, and he saw it as something that was an important part of his legacy. So we really owe uh, Christy and Jill for making it a reality. And it's great to see the Institute thriving and filling the function that Clayton foresaw of educating students, uh, the public, and the farm community about how trade impacts Nebraska and the farm economy. As far as what it was like to work with Clayton, I think, well, first of all, you're talking about someone who had boundless energy and required only five hours of sleep. Um, he had an ego uh, because you don't become a senior cabinet official without an ego and a lot of drive. But he was also a Midwesterner and a Nebraskan to the core. And one of his strengths was that he liked all types of people. And no matter what their status or rank, he treated them in a warm, respectful way. He treated the career staff at USGR as colleagues and part of his team. He really didn't need much staff because he probably knew the issues better than most of us, but uh, he would always listen to even what uh, junior staffers had to say. And after his time as secretary, we would go over to USDA, you'd see career officials, but also the secretaries and the administrative staff pop out of their offices to say hi. As far as 
his uh, role as a visionary. For 50 years, he was one of the leading proponents of an export-oriented American agriculture. He helped transform America's farm economy from a heavy dependence on price support programs and government checks into the current focus on exports. And that has led to huge increases in exports and farm incomes. Uh, a lot of uh, visionaries uh, can come up with great ideas, but Clayton actually had the skills to make them a reality uh, through his trade deals. So he was an incredibly skilled negotiator who could uh, really land some of the biggest deals to open markets for American products. He had really an instinctive, intuitive feel for how far he could push things to get uh, deals for American industrial goods, services, technology, and especially agriculture uh, without blowing things up. And his deals really have um, uh, stood the test of time and are really uh, bedrocks of agricultural trade and the global trading system today. So our uh, paths first overlapped at USTR. And at that point in my career, I was a relatively new and very junior staff attorney. And the career staff really liked uh, Bill Brock, Clayton's predecessor, and they didn't know quite what to make of Clayton and all this talk about Clayton Yider rhymes with fighter. But he uh, brought uh, needed energy and vision to the agency and he stabilized U.S. trade policy and especially U.S.-Japan trade relations when both were under a lot of protection pressures. It's really a long, long list of trade accomplishments, so I'm going to stick to a few. When he went to uh, Punta del Este to negotiate the launch of the Uruguay round, what he wanted more than anything else was an agreement on GATT negotiations to bring agriculture into the trading, global trading system. It had been you know, sort of a peripheral part of the uh, GATT in 1947, but it had essentially uh, been left out in part because of our Section 22. Uh, so bringing agriculture into the system was a lifelong dream, and the Uruguay Round Agreement on Agriculture was one of his crowning accomplishments. Um, when he dealt with Japan, he could see the potential for American beef, citrus, soybeans, and other products if we could penetrate Japan's system. And more than that, he understood Japan's system and how the various tariff and non-tariff barriers fit together. So his beef deal set really what became a roadmap for future American negotiators to open up uh, Japan's agricultural market. Uh, his US-Canada free trade agreement was the first major US FDA. We dabbled with it in Israel, but Canada was a major, major trading partner. And the Canada FDA laid the foundations for NAFTA and a huge expansion of North American agricultural trade so that Canada and Mexico now are two of our top export markets. Um, finally, I do a lot of work now for the semiconductor industry and it still credits Ambassador Yider's US-Japan semiconductor arrangement for saving uh, the US industry when it was under siege uh, from Japan. And afterwards, I'm told that uh, Japan's Ministry of Economic Trade and Industry and Ministry of Foreign Relations swore they would never do another agreement like the Japan Semiconductor Agreement, and they never have. So what Clayton got there is pretty unique. Um, so, you know, we're uh, talking about um, a career that uh, really remade uh, the trading system and remade American agriculture. So I think if anyone does, he counts as a visionary. Thank you, Warren. That's a long list of big achievements. And I want to turn to Darcy now. And Darcy, Clayton was a mentor for you. Um, you were the U.S. Chief Agricultural Negotiator most recently in your government service. So tell us a little bit more about what your most important takeaways were from Clayton in terms of approaching agricultural trade negotiating and how his accomplishments paved the way for what you came after him to do yourself as a negotiator. Uh, well, thanks, Jill, for that. I mean, I think there are 
a number of things that, that Warren mentioned, just in terms of forming really that architecture for how agriculture relates to trade. I would share a couple of things. Um, Clayton was a mentor to me, and I think uh, Warren uh, made the point about how he treated other people, um, even when he was sometimes twisting their arms to get negotiating outcomes from them. Um, I didn't get to know Clayton until he had been out of government service for quite some time. Um, and I think I encountered him at a point in his life where he was um, thinking about the next generation of people that would be forming and building on the framework that, that he laid and was a beneficiary of that, as are all of the students now who will participate in, in the Eider Institute's programs. But um, to your point about first meeting Clayton, um, one of my first really lengthy interactions with him was when he came to lobby me <laughs> with some of his clients. And I had met him very briefly before. Of course, you know, if you work in agricultural trade, you know who Clayton Yider is. You know, he's a former Secretary of Agriculture and a former USTR. And Warren, you may have been with him <laughs> in this meeting, but they came in to talk about a codex matter. And he introduced himself to me as Clayton. And, you know, just like he was some guy off the street. Hi, I'm Clayton. Um, and with his clients referred to me, and at the time I was 35, I had only been in this role as Deputy Undersecretary for a couple of months, and every person in the room was older than I was. And he, you know, introduced himself, um, not using his title, but referred to me as Secretary Vetter throughout the meeting, and really just showed sort of um, a, a deference uh, to the office, um, was incredibly gracious and respectful, and it was very, uh, very kind of him and very, very Clayton. Um, and then one other thing that, that I, he did, and I think spent a, a good period of time uh, doing in the last decade or so uh, of his life, was making sure that that future set of voices uh, were heard. And one of the experiences I most treasure with Clayton was being able to deliver jointly the Hewerman Lecture um, with him. And it gave me a chance to come back to Nebraska to talk about the future of agricultural trade, but to do it next to the person who had really formed the foundation that I was getting to build upon. And um, the only reason I was in that chair with him was because he was asked to give that lecture and he said, I'll only do it if Darcy can do it with me um, so that we can hear, uh, you know, that the, about the foundation that I lead, but where it's going from here. And I just treasure that experience of doing that with him, but just also want to say that he kept his eye on um, how he could continue to contribute and to support others throughout um, his life. Um, but I would say as a negotiator, Clayton reminded me on several occasions um, that negotiating, and, and part of the reason that he loved it and I loved it, we had a conversation about this once, is that negotiating is at once a left brain and a right brain exercise. And that, you know, Warren already mentioned that he was like the most prepared. He understood the issues. He had done the analysis. You have to know which product at which time is going to be worth the most to your beef producers or, you know, the poultry guys. Um, and so you need to know the numbers, that left brain piece. But a lot of negotiating is building trust with the people across the table, with your stakeholders at home, and really using your gut um, and using your listening to make sure that you know how much can the political process bear um, before the other side packs up and goes home, right? You need to push it as far as you can without breaking it. Um, and I think he had a really good um, sense of that. And he encouraged me in doing that, you know, and, and I remember a couple of emails where he said, oh, it looks like everyone's mad at you. You must be doing something right. Or, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're getting restless. But remember, this deal is bigger than, you know, just pork or uh, bigger than just the, you know, what the soybean folks want. It's an overall relationship that we're going to think about and build on in the future. And I think he helped me be a better um, negotiator that way. Um, speaking more granularly, I mean, the, the foundation that he built, the tools that he used to start opening up that beef market, that's, I picked up where he left off, right, when we had another chance to negotiate in TPP. And so the tariff structure, um, the safeguards that were put in place, those all were hooks then for me to start uh, figuring out how to, to further open that market. 
And a lot of what Clayton was able to do was, you know, to really get our foot in the door. Um, but there were still ways that the Japanese government helped to control or manage trade. Um, but even those were laid out in such a way that we could start to peel away those next layers of, of the onion. There was sort of a, a playbook uh, we could use because of how those original deals were structured. And so um, it was interesting for me to get to ask him, you know, what was the hardest part about this piece? Or this is kind of an interesting thing. Why does it look like that, do you think? Um, what do you think they valued politically versus economically? Um, and it was just really valuable to be able to ask him um, those questions as uh, I was able to uh, address those things uh, in TPP. Thank you, Darcy, for that, that reflection. So you've both talked about agriculture, the architecture of the system. Clayton was instrumental in launching the negotiation that resulted in the creation of the World Trade Organization, as you, you well know. Warren, you've talked about how agriculture, more than anything, needs the WTO to function. That's an organization under a lot of stress right now. Um, tell us a little bit more about the stakes for agriculture and the WTO, why it's so important for this industry, um, and where you see that headed, what Clayton might have thought about where this is headed now. And Darcy, too, of course, please weigh in on this one. Well, Jill, probably more than any other sector of the US economy, agriculture benefits from um, strong global rules with broad worldwide coverage. Um, it doesn't do much good if the United States agrees to limit uh, farm subsidies in a free trade agreement because it leaves a host of free riders out there who are not part of the free trade agreement and can still subsidize away. And agriculture uh, really faces the highest tariffs and the most non-tariff barriers particularly sanitary, phytosanitary measures, uh, just because it's politically sensitive for most governments and most of them are really eager to protect their domestic farmers. So our uh, farmers benefited when markets were open broadly under, around the world in the Uruguay round. And when uh, the WTO set uh, basically worldwide baselines for market access and subsidization. Um, this was supposed to be um, the starting point for further negotiations. And I think it's really unfortunate that uh, that's never uh, come about and the WTO has basically stalled. And uh, finally, um, agricultural disputes like the US uh, disputes with the European Union over the common agricultural policy in the 1980s tend to be some of the most intractable. So agriculture benefits from a strong multilateral enforcement mechanism, which the WTO provided at least until the uh, pellet body went off the rails. And it's um, much, much better for our farmers if disputes can be resolved through a multilateral dispute settlement system, rather than through us uh, slapping on tariffs under section 301 since as we've seen with the US-China uh, tariff fights over the last few years, uh, the main beneficiary of something like that um, has been Brazil. Um, so agriculture really needs trade deals. They open markets uh, and they bring some of the uh, barriers really under control. Darcy, I'm going to ask you if you have any response on that one. And also one question for you. You said something a few years ago I thought was striking um, to a group of students and that you said when you, you're at the negotiating table in a multilateral setting, you and your colleagues from the U.S. were always very aware that not only were you negotiating for the United States on that particular issue, but you were also aware that you were negotiating and standing up for the system itself and the maintenance of that system and that the U.S. has really traditionally stepped in to play that role. Um, so if you could reflect a little bit more on that um, as well, where do you think leadership is needed right now in the trading system and what might Clayton have had to say about that right now? That's right. I mean, I think the United States really was instrumental in building the whole um, uh, trade financial and political architecture after World War II. And we created these systems and organizations like the GATT that became the WTO because we realized that we benefited from um, 
global guidelines about the movement of goods and people and ideas. And that the system itself, that predictability, the certainty, um, as Warren noted with the appellate body, the place to resolve disputes and not have them uh, snowball into larger uh, disputes that could ripple across whole economies or turn into more political disagreements as well. Um, we knew we were fighting for that and not just for um, the specific issues we were negotiating. Um, but you asked also about um, how we sort of keep our eye on that, that the system itself uh, needs tending perhaps and what challenges we're facing in negotiating today. And as I was thinking about um, this event and about Clayton, and just reflecting a little bit on his accomplishments, I think one of the things that we perhaps suffer from or maybe a tension in the way that we negotiate a trade today um, is that trade negotiators sort of live in our own little technical world sometimes. And that as these negotiations get more and more technical on you know, specifics of intellectual property rights or you know, data flows and and geographic indications and you know that the vocabulary and the issues grow more and more technical which means the negotiators themselves really need to be technical experts but the reasons why we're negotiating are much more sort of universal and we need to be able to explain why we're fighting um, for some of these rules and why we're investing in these trade rules and you know clayton operated in several worlds he understood what farmers wanted and needed and agribusiness. He could, as Secretary of Agriculture, he understood how the trade rules affected decisions um, in the communities in Nebraska and elsewhere. Um, he understood the financial markets from his time at the Mercantile Exchange. He understood politically what the motivations were of some of his Republican colleagues from his time in the party. And so he could talk about the bigger vision of what we were doing in trade as well as being versed in the technical aspects. And I, I really think that as these negotiations get more complicated and more comprehensive, we need more people like Clayton um, who can sort of wear both of those hats and remind us why that international architecture is so important. Uh, and you know, I think that is one of the, the real tensions that we see is um, that, that sort of specialist tendency on the one hand and people who can uh, create a vision for trade as the generalist on the other. Thank you. I have one more question for both of our, our guests here, and then we have time for just one or two audience questions. There's a couple of students um, here with mics that they can run around to you if you have a question. But Darcy and Warren, I want to ask you a little bit about the U.S. rule in Asia. We've talked a lot already about beef, and we hear a lot about that in Nebraska. We know Japan is the most important export market for Nebraska beef. We've heard a little about what Clayton did to pave the way to open that market and the hard work he did there. But right now, at a time when there are major trade deals going forward in the region without the U.S., like the CPTPP or the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, for example, and there's a lot of discussion, debate, thinking right now about what the U.S. role there should be economically, tell us a little bit more about how you see that um, and you see U.S. policy developing toward that region um, and what Clayton might have thought about that, too, um, at this time. Warren, do you want to start? Well, um, Clayton thought that TPP would come back just because it um, made too much uh, strategic sense. And right now, we're in a really unfortunate situation where the United States is not part of the two major Asia-Pacific regional free trade agreements. So our competitors, uh, you know, uh, enjoy preferential market access under uh, the RCEP agreement and the CPTPP. And our U.S. industries, farmers and service providers don't. So uh, over time, I think what we're going to see is uh, regional supply chains grow up around the RCEP countries. It's a more limited agreement than um, TPP or CPTPP, but it's still has some important tariff preferences. Um, and around CPTPP, which is actually a good agreement that uh, folks like Darcy had a major hand in putting together. Um, and the consequence is that we're gonna lose uh, market share in some of the world's most rapidly growing agricultural markets. Um, we're gonna see 
uh, U.S. companies start to move production into the RCEP and TPP regions, so they're no longer at a um, competitive uh, disadvantage, and we're going to see regional supply chains grow up that exclude U.S. suppliers. Um, the Trump administration um, uh, basically uh, salvaged the situation because um, after we withdrew from TPP, uh, we were on the verge of losing um, our share of the Japanese beef market just because Australia, Canada, um, and others had uh, serious tariff preferences, and we didn't. So the cost of U.S. Uh, beef was uh, higher than Australia and Canada. Um, but they managed to pull it together with um, the U.S.-Japan early harvest agreement. But that was a pretty narrow thing. Um, and we're seeing other markets out there like uh, uh, Vietnam, uh, China, uh, Malaysia, that uh, probably would have good demand for American farm products, but um, our competitors um, have a leg up on us. Now, the worst thing is that China has applied to join CPTPP, uh, which is the uh, successor that was put together after we pulled out. But if that happens, um, I personally think it's going to be a disaster for American uh, national security and for trade, because we'll be on the outside looking in at a region where we have huge economic and security interests. And those agreements mean it could be increasingly dominated by China if it manages to force its way in. Darcy? Yeah, well, I mean, I think Warren has said it very well, that I do worry that, um, you know, by not being part of either uh, CPTPP or RCEP, uh, we really are losing ground in a very dynamic region where U.S. products and especially agricultural products um, are in demand. And the, um, you know, we're at a competitive disadvantage when we should, frankly, be the supplier of choice just because of, of what we produce and the fact that we do it well. Um, but, you know, I would just stress where Warren left off, which is that the strategic importance of having deep and continuous and lasting relationships in that region are, it, it's tremendous. And, you know, let's not lose sight of the fact that in TPP, we were creating new market opportunities, but we were also selling our ideas, our way of doing business, our commitment to transparency, um, the way that we look at the rule of law, um, the you know, overall commitments on labor environment and human rights, uh, which are very important to this current administration and were built into uh, the operation of, of TPP. And so we have to, I think, find a way to, um, to rebuild those relationships or to insert ourselves in the region in a way that's positive and fosters those ideas. And you know, we get hung up a lot on the specific provisions and trade agreements, and they're very important, right? What's the tariff level going to be? But that piece of paper is the beginning. Um, when I think about NAFTA, the relationship we have with Canada and Mexico, the way that we regionally support each other in other international institutions is because we are implementing that agreement every day, and we understand each other, and we have to work through problems to keep those provisions going. And so, you know, negotiating the agreement is the start of it, implementing it all the time, and then unleashing business to take advantage of it and deepen their relationships. Um, that's really the dividends of that, is that, you know, once you're committed to that relationship, then it grows and it takes on um, broader importance than just the, the tariff um, limit, you know, reducing tariffs themselves. And so those are the kinds of relationships we really need in the region. And we're going to have to find a way to, to foster them if it's not through TPP. I do think there's a lot of attention in the press just these past couple of days about um, digital uh, economic agreements. And, you know, that's really an area where the trade policy or the rules around digital trade haven't been written yet. Um, there are countries in Asia who are trying to get together to, to do that, right? That original set of rules. I think it's important for the U.S., given how important digital trade is to the economy and the role that we have tended to play in institutions. I would think we would want to be in on the ground floor 
of creating the first agreements that try to create an architecture around digital trade. And so we may not see ourselves go back into TPP. It may be a while before we delve into a big comprehensive trade agreement negotiation, but I think there are some smaller agreements like this one um, where we could be creating a new architecture that would be economically beneficial, but also solving some big problems like data privacy and cybersecurity and, you know, getting around um, issues that deal with the security of the region as well. Thank you both. We have time for just a, a question. If anyone in the audience has one, we have a microphone um, here that can be brought to you if you have a question for either Warren or Darcy. No questions. They've shared a lot with us already, a lot of insight as they always do. So we will, um, oh, we have one. Okay, please, um, if you could run the mic over there. Thank you. Yes, I would like you uh, to comment maybe on uh, TTIP or the, the debt TTIP. Uh, since uh, Mexico and Canada have a EU agreement, why, why can't the US uh, also have an agreement? So our, our NAFTA partners succeeded in doing it, and so why can't we? <laughs> um, well, maybe I will, will start here. You know, I actually, we obviously, and when it comes to agriculture, have had a number of entrenched disagreements with the EU and different ways that we approach regulation, um, food safety technology in particular. Um, and those have, have made finding common ground around agreement very difficult. Uh, but I don't think that's quite the only reason. Uh, I think if you have political will, the creativity on how you deal with those things uh, maybe can, can come. Um, and it would require compromise on on both sides. Um, but I am I'm somewhat encouraged by things like digital trade that I just mentioned, and frankly, by the size of the challenge that China brings to the table. And so maybe TTIP uh, trying to take this on as one comprehensive endeavor has not yet worked. Um, but I think thinking about our futures. Um, the future of agriculture in Europe and the EU, um, the future of, of trade and wanting to influence it in ways that are consistent with Western values. Um, I don't think anybody's gonna put chlorinated chicken on the top of the list of the things that really are in the pressing problems that Europe and the US faces, right? I think we have uh, climate change, we have protection of, of human rights to deal with. But the fact is that freer movement of people and goods and ideas help us to tackle those bigger problems. And when it comes to Europe, when it even comes to the WTO and its rules on where to focus our energies, um, I think, I wish we had Clayton with us to say, okay, how, how do we creatively rethink about this architecture so that we can, can maybe the problem, biggest problems of the day aren't trade specifically and people wouldn't say tariffs are the thing. Uh, I think the question we need to be asking ourselves is in what ways can trade in the trade system? And again, that freer movement of people, goods and ideas help us tackle these really existential problems we have elsewhere. And then let's get to work on them. Um, we maybe need to frame our challenges in different ways. And I think there's some chances to do that with Europe. Warren, well, any thoughts on this one? I've always thought that a, a free trade agreement with uh, Europe made a lot of sense. and. Um, I think it was like about 25 years ago, Clayton and I wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal about a NAFTA for Europe. Um, the problems with uh, TTIP aren't on the US side, they're uh, over in Europe, and uh, particularly that they're scared to death of American agriculture. So they would do an agreement in a minute if it was just industrial tariffs, investment, and services, where we get along, great. but. Um, as Darcy pointed out, we've had long-standing differences over agriculture, and it's mainly because uh, they know that we're a lot better at agriculture th than they are, and that if we were allowed unimpeded access to their market, um, we would blast our way into Europe. So, you know, a free trade agreement with Europe makes a lot of sense. Um, we would be on the attack on 
almost all of the issues, I think. But um, it would take um, Europe getting over its squeamishness about uh, American farmers and how good and efficient and low cost they are. Thank you both. Um, Warren and Darcy, thank you so much for joining us from afar to share your reflections about Clayton Yider and your insights. We are very grateful for your participation here today. Thank you. It's been an honor. Now we get to hear from the author himself of Rhymes with Fighter. Um, Joe Weber is an associate professor of journalism here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Previously, he spent many years reporting and writing for Business Week, where he ran the magazine's bureaus in three major cities, including Chicago, where he covered the Chicago Mercantile Exchange as a reporter, where Clayton Yeider once served as president and CEO. Joe, congratulations on the publication of an excellent book, and the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Jill, and, and thank you all for coming. Uh, this is just enormously, enormously satisfying to be here. Um, and I think the presence of so many people here is a testimony to that gentleman there. Um, Clayton Yeider had such an extraordinary impact on so many people. Um, some of you here knew him quite well, uh, others perhaps only by his reputation, which of course was exceptionally good. Um, and those of you who knew him, I'm sure, have very warm memories of him. Um, I was actually never privileged to meet Dr. Yeider, unfortunately. Um, but I did spend a lot of time uh, going through that trove of documents that uh, Christie alluded to over at the uh, depository in the library system. Um, and I did get a real sense of his personality from correspondence from people like uh, President Ronald Reagan. President George H.W. Bush, to whom he was very close, and George Bush wrote, wrote very warm letters to him, um, as well as other people. Clayton also had lots and lots of correspondence that he shared with people all over the world, including relatives that he found in Germany, um, and he would be very personal in these letters, and it, it gave me a real sense of the man beyond the public persona. Um, now, in terms of the public persona, he generated literally thousands of headlines around the world in his highest profile days. And those were in the 1980s and 1990s. And those clips, along with literally thousands more letters and government documents and speech texts and photos and all that, are stored in the library uh, in the documents depository. Corey, if you'd switch to the next slide. So that's what the back shop of the depository looks like. Corey, another one if you would. So uh, here's another view. Um, it reminds me a lot of the final scene in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, for those of you who remember, those of you young enough to remember that movie. Um, and we all have librarian Katie Jones to thank for organizing uh, the simply enormous trove of Yider documents. Um, they're in several hundred jam-packed boxes that reflect his life from the earliest days on a little Depression-era farm near Eustis to the heights of global political influence. By the way, as long as I'm acknowledging folks, uh, I must thank uh, a few people for encouraging me to undertake this book. First of all, uh, Christy Yeider, uh, who is to Clayton Yeider what Eliza Hamilton was to Alexander Hamilton, someone determined to see her husband's contributions memorialized for history. Um, I'm going to be awaiting the play. I hope you have connections there. Um, she was open, she was candid with me about Dr. Yeider, and that reflects her journalism background. Also, Jill O'Donnell has a journalism background, uh, which was extremely helpful to me. I have to thank um, Mike Zeleny of the Chancellor's Office, Chancellor Ronnie Green, and my former dean, Amy Struthers. I don't know if she's here or not, but she allowed me to have the time to, to do this uh, in um, the summer, fall, and early winter of 2019 over in the library before COVID shut us all down. Um, okay, Corey, the next one, if you would. Let me talk briefly about Yider's global influence. It was, in a word, extraordinary, and I do not use that word lightly. The attention that he got in his prime came not because he was a politician constantly on the evening news, because he wasn't, but rather because he was an exceptionally successful public official, often laboring quietly all across the world. 
And in that role, it turns out he had more influence on the economic development of the world in recent years than any of those elected officials. Now that is a very big statement, okay? It's a very big statement, but I will repeat it. Clayton Yeider had more of an impact on global economic development in the last half century than any elected official in the US. Uh, if the clothes we all wear now come from Vietnam or Malaysia, or the phones that we use come from China, or the cars that we drive have parts from all over the world, particularly Mexico, if our farmers export their corn and beef all around the world, we can thank Dr. Yeider for that. Now, he did not do that all by himself, of course, but he opened the world to global trade as never before in the era before him. Next one, if you would. And you do not have to take my word for it, okay? Here is what a former colleague of his said. The world is better off. Poverty is lower. Middle class is growing. Hundreds of millions of people around the world have economic opportunity thanks to the opening of global trade that Dr. Yeider led to. The next one, if you would, please. Here's what uh, Dr. Yeider himself said when he took the job as U.S. Trade Representative for President Reagan in 1986. Change the world. And, but there's modesty there. Uh, Warren Mariyama said he had an ego, and of course he had an ego. But he recognized that he wasn't the only one. Of course, there were many people who succeeded him as well who did this and who he helped, including people like Carla Hills, who was instrumental in NAFTA. Um, you might, in a sense, say that Clayton Yeider was the grandfather of NAFTA, uh, if he wasn't the direct father. Uh, next one, please, if you would. So this is what a successor of his as U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Mike Johans, our own Mike Johans, said of him. He started kicking down the door when he came to agriculture trade. And the next one, if you would, Corey. Again, Secretary Johans. Now, serving as U.S. Trade Representative under President Reagan and then as U.S. Secretary of Agriculture under President George Bush, the elder, Yeider laid the groundwork for the biggest opening and expansion of world trade ever. He didn't do it alone, as I said, and he had successors who built on it, but he set the table for the growth, and I'll show you how. Next one, if you would, please. The growth has been extraordinary. Check out those data points. So as a journalist, I like to see hard evidence to back up the assertions that the previous people made. Okay, I like to see the numbers. And here are some points that support those. World trade has simply exploded since Yeider and his colleagues paved the way for it in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Now, this has brought mixed results. We all recognize that. But in the main, it lifted literally millions of people out of poverty in places like China. An extraordinary profound effect. The next one, if you would, Corey. Now, because he was a PhD economist who understood markets, he also had led the Chicago Mercantile Exchange for seven years. So he understood the all-important agriculture futures markets. And because he was a lawyer who understood deal-making, and because he himself had been a farmer, he got the ball rolling on all of that. He had this unique skill set that made him a man of the moment an extraordinary skill set that he brought, as well as a Midwesterner's friendly and honest demeanor, but also a Depression-era, Depression-bred toughness to his efforts. Next one, if you would, Corey. So as U.S. Trade Representative, he made his huge impact through two main efforts. One was a crucial meeting in the fall of 1986 in which trade ministers came together for five very long days and nights of bargaining, cajoling, and fist fighting, as Dr. Yeider metaphorically described it, fortunately. They gathered in a casino resort town in Uruguay called Punta del Este. That meeting set the agenda for the trade talks that would lead to, ultimately, to the dramatic cuts in tariffs, reductions in trade barriers, and ultimately the establishment of the World Trade Organization that some of the speakers earlier mentioned. That is the entity that plays a central role in keeping trade going. And it's really tragic that Dr. Yeider is not with us now because the World Trade Organization is on the ropes in some ways. And I think somebody with his brain power, his energy, and his insight could keep it going. Next one, if you would, please. 
So that's a little hard to see, but the Uruguay round of trade talks, they, they lasted several years. It was the last successful global bargaining round. Nothing like it has come before, and nothing like it has come since. And it all began in Punta del Este with Yeider. The bargaining there got really tough. At one point, Dr. Yeider told the American delegation to pack their bags and be ready to go home early if he didn't see the movement that he needed to see. Threats such as that got things done. Not that he was somebody who made threats a lot, but he made them when they counted. He also did a lot of sensitive horse trading and a lot of diplomacy. He had friends among our trading enemies, <laughs> among our trading opponents, that were extraordinary. He had warm personal relationships with them. Next one, if you would. He also succeeded in, by negotiating the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement of 1988. That showed the world how cutting trade barriers could drive up trade with all the good things that come from that. The U.S.-Canada FTA led in turn to NAFTA, which did even more to bring the benefits of free markets to trade across North America. By the way, I expect you're all keenly aware that NAFTA brought downsides to some parts of the industrial Midwest, and Dr. Yeider was aware of the downsides to some of these markets as well, but these, these openings of these markets as well, but on balance and overall, it was an extraordinary plus. So here is what Jim Baker, a former US Trade Secretary, said on the point and its impact. Next one, if you would, please. And here are some data points. Again, I look for the data to back it up. Here are data points that buttress the contention. The expansion of trade was simply extraordinary immediately following the US FTA, and it has grown astronomically since. Next one, if you would. There was a lot of talk about Japan in the earlier presentations. Uh, Dr. Yeider made a huge impact by cutting deals with countries including Japan and those in the European community to break down those trade barriers. And for specific types of products, especially in agriculture, he had a major impact. Now, sometimes he had to pressure such countries. He had legal actions brought before global trade bodies, and sometimes he could do so with bargaining with them in a more personal way. Uh, he began his most important work as the U.S. Trade Representative, and then he wrapped it up as Secretary of Agriculture. This is what Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said of him. This was in a letter that was hand-delivered to Christy Yeider at his memorial service, uh, in, in, uh, at Dr. Yeider's memorial service in his honor. Yeider had fought the Japanese hard on a lot of market opening issues, but he built strong and deep friendships there as well. He was actually honored posthumously by the Japanese with their Grand Cordon of the Order of the Rising Sun, one of the greatest honors the country can bestow. And he got this even though he was also known in Japan as the dreaded Yeider-san. He had a tough-minded approach to opening the very closed markets there. Next one, if you would, please. Now, one key question is, how did he do all of this, right? Well, he did it with a mixture of toughness, with candor, with a willingness always to see the other guy's needs and views. He approached negotiations with the view that everybody has to walk away from the table with something to bring home. They all had political masters back home, all these trade ministers. They had to bring something home. They had to be win-wins, or you are not going to get representatives of the European Union, for instance, to crack open, open any of their markets. Next one, if you would, please. He developed great personal relationships with his opposite numbers, trade ministers from around the world. To illustrate that, this is a photo that he and the European Community Agriculture Minister Ray McSharry posed for for Top Producer magazine. That was when uh, Dr. Yutter was a U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, knocking on the EC's door and try to break in, try, trying to break in. He was known for his big personality, a personality that could fill a room, people told me. He also had an extraordinary memory for names and the, and the familial details about the people he dealt with. His personal correspondence is just chock full of family references and other personal details about trade officials all over the world. He liked people. He got to know them well. He got to know what they needed, and he worked to get that done. It was a win-win deal. That's what he needed. That's, that's, what he, that's the way he worked. Next one, if you would, please. He was so unusual in so many respects. One trade consultant that he worked with a lot, Carol Brookins, hit on some of his personality with this comment about him. 
She'll never forget how he, how he personally touched her when she was ill. Next one, if you would, please, Corey. Similarly, here's what Gary Blumenthal, his former chief of staff at the Ag Department said. Personality made a huge difference. Next one, if you would, please, Corey. Now, let me close with just a few personal points about his life. Um, if I keep going, you'll have no reason to buy the book, and I don't want to <laughs> do that. Plus, you also probably want to get home. Okay, let me close with a few personal points about his life. It began on a little farm near Eustis, Nebraska, as I mentioned, as others have mentioned. Uh, it was during the Depression, and Yeiter recalled going to school with cardboard in his shoes at times. Times were very tough. Next one, if you would, please. But it wasn't all that horrible. He had a dog, Sport, and he had a cat, whose name has been lost to history. Next one. He did very well in 4-H, which was the organization that really opened his world beyond Nebraska. That's him with the number photoshopped onto his chest. I have no idea why that number is photoshopped onto his chest, but there he is as a young man. Next one, if you would, please. Um, he wound up going to Washington, D.C. for the first time with 4-H. And he got his first taste there of the place that would be his home decades late, later. Christy Eider referred to the fact that he never threw anything away. Well, this, is, this clip is ancient, absolutely ancient. And there's some that go back even further. This is from the Omaha World Herald. Um, so he wound up going to DC, and that place would be his home decades later. And this is the piece that he wrote for the, wrote for the Omaha World Herald, which paid for the 4-H camp trip for Eider and for others. Next one. He really shone at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I don't know if you can make him out there. If you see that little red line there, he's the one with the slight smile on his face amid all these very stern people. Um, and I have wondered about that woman in the middle there. Boy, she must have had a tough time with that fraternity. That was the farmhouse fraternity. Um, uh, the, the, the farmhouse return, fraternity routinely got the highest GPAs among all the fraternities on campus. They probably still do. Um, and he was very loyal to that fraternity, and he stuck with these guys, many of these guys, all his life. He, he made friends all along the way, and he kept them. I, got, I was privileged able, and able to talk to some of his high school uh, friends, and uh, of course they remembered him warmly. He would come back occasionally for reunions and so on, and they, they remembered him. Uh, let's see here. So UNL really opened his eyes to the great intellectual possibilities that there were in life as he explored it. Uh, he ranked at the top of his class in law and economics after uh, being an undergraduate. He earned his doctorate and law degree simultaneously, which was an, ex an extraordinary achievement, doing both of those degrees at the same time. Can you imagine? Um, he, what he said was he thought there were only two people in the country at the time doing, doing that sort of simultaneous study, and he was one of them. Next one, if you would, please. So he was a moderate Republican. He did not support Ronald Reagan or Richard Nixon at first, though he did wind up working for both men. Next one. He was especially close to George Bush the Elder, who was probably more intellectually um, attuned to him and politically attuned to him. He had a temperamental and intellectual affinity for, they, they did for each other. By the way, he had no use for Donald Trump. He did not vote for him. He actually wrote in a vote for Mitch Daniels um, he did wind up serving as head of the Republican National Committee at President Bush's request because the party was in a period of tumult, and he was there to stable it. Now, some of his achievements, such as gerrymandering, uh, were somewhat questionable, at least. Um, but he was head of a very different party than the current GOP. Incidentally, this book is a biography. They wanted an objective, even-handed and fair and thorough biography. It's not a hagiography. This occasion is a time for celebrating this great man. But you can also read about shortcomings, disappointments, setbacks. Maybe you'll agree or disagree with some things in the book. Um, I was asked to do an honest and full portrait, and then I hope the book does that. Next one, if you would, please. So that is a capsule view. I'd be happy to have a discussion and take some questions if we have time for that.
Anybody have any questions or comments? People who know him, I'd love to hear what your comments are. No one? Ah. Um, so today there's lots of discussions about free trade and it seems like it's kind of controversial. Donald yeah. Trump did not support it. In the Democratic Party, Bernie Sanders wasn't a fan of it. Um, so back in the 1980s, were there similar dis debates and how did he respond to that? Absolutely. Um, Yeider had to fight people in his own party quite often. Um, if you are a senator from a state that is uh, going to lose because of the opening of markets, you're going to fight it. And many did. He had fights in the Republican Party. He had fights, even greater fights, in the Democratic Party. Lots and lots of skepticism about free trade. He had to push the ball. You know, he had to push that up a, a fairly high hill. Um, those things don't go away. You know, that is a constant argument in our economy and our political system, and they were going on then. And that, frankly, makes his achievements even more Herculean, because not only did he have to contend with anti-free traders in the U.S. system, but he had to contend with anti-free traders in other countries. People wanted to protect their markets. And to bust those things down, as he started to do in the, in the Punta del Este meetings, was simply extraordinary. And, um, you know, if, if, again, we can always speculate, um, I think things might be different if we had somebody with his personality and his, his uh, influence and his intellectual framework as a trained economist, right, as a trained economist in those positions. Does that help? You know, free trade is just a, 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 a wonderful, wonderful thing. And actually, I should... I should be precise about this. He believed in freer trade, okay? Meaning you open as much as you can and you open as much as possible, right? It's not necessarily a full free trade system because you're always going to have, have to protect some things. So he, he, he took what he got. Yes, sir. So Please. Joe, I'm just this is a little bit of putting you on the spot question. and. And I don't say this just because Senator Luann Lu Lu Lenahan's here from the legislature okay. and has been dealing so well with this issue in our okay. state currently. But, you know, Clayton, you talk about in the book, early in his career, was one of the whiz kids who worked with Governor Thone. And the, the whole structuring of Nebraska's tax system, basically, into the three-legged stool. At that time, it was very controversial. I, I wasn't around. Many of us weren't. But... It was very controversial. It, you, can you channel anything about what he would think today when we're struggling with this? You know, it's a little bit awkward question to ask you. But. Well, I, I, I would be loath to speculate. I'm a journalist, I'm not a pundit. But um, I will tell you what he did, which was he believed that the state government had a crucial, crucial role in the state's economy, and it had to be appropriately funded. And unfortunately, what happened was the good citizens of Nebraska voted out all the revenue for the state. There was no system for collecting money for the state of Nebraska when he came in with the governor who was the, the governor at that time. Um, in fact, that governor wound up serving one term because they instituted a tax system uh, which was... Um, it was a three-legged stool, as you, as, you, as you say. It was a tax system that was phenomenally unpopular. It wasn't enormous, but it was phenomenally unpopular. And we still argue about this. You know, the, the farmers are unhappy about property taxes. The wealthy people in Omaha are unhappy about income taxes. That was really fascinating for me. So here's a Republican. <laughs> here's a Republican in Nebraska who is writing about, oh, those wealthy people in Omaha, they just don't want to pay their fair share what he said. And, but he knew, again, he was a moderate and reasonable Republican of the type that one of my call, colleagues called endangered today, right? And that means that he believed that government played a crucial role. In many ways, he was an Eisenhower Republican or a Rockefeller Republican who was the fellow that he initially supported. Um, 
one of his sons told me that he really would be very troubled by the party that he sees today. Does that, does that help? Any other questions, sir? Yes, sir. Oh, this is one of the agricultural economists. Uh-oh. No, lawyer. <laughs> oh, oh, even worse. <laughs> um, curious, uh, we heard some, one of the key achievements of the Uruguay round negotiations was reintegrating agriculture back in the system, but other major achievements were uh, including trade in services as well as intellectual property. And just wanted to get your thoughts on, uh, on Clayton's work in those two areas, trade in services and intellectual yeah. property. Again, what he did was he set the table in Punta for the, uh, for the opening of these areas. The way that, the, and I defer to the trade experts here, much more knowledgeable about this than I am, but the way that these negotiations unfolded was all the ministers came together from 74 countries or whatever it was in this little gambling town, and they said, okay, what is going to be on the agenda for the Uruguay round? What are we going to talk about? What is off the table, what is on the table? Agriculture was put on the table for the first time, along with things like services, intellectual property, et cetera. Those things hadn't been really discussed before. And he got them on the agenda for talks that lasted for many years afterwards. And, and the way it worked was they then came to agreements and ultimately they came to, uh, to sign a document and it reduced the tariffs around the world by a simply extraordinary amount in all of these areas and opened the world to things like services. You know, I suspect that, you know, in the law business, uh, part of the reason we have global law firms now probably has to do with the way he opened the markets. Does that help? Okay. I'm sorry? Yes, that's true. I'm told one more. Come on, somebody's got to disagree here. It's no fun if you don't disagree. The fellow up there talking about free trade came close, came close. <laughs> he was, well, he was an exceptional man with extraordinary achievements. Um, and a very warm person as well from all, everything that I saw in the correspondence. And uh, I'm sorry that I didn't get a chance to, to know him except through the documents, but, um, and through lots of interviews with people who, who were touched by him. Um, and to a person, they had extraordinary things to say about him. So, enough. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah, actually, I forgot. We have a presentation to make. Okay, Christy, would you come on up, please? Thank you so much. A copy of the book, inscribed appropriately, I hope. <laughs> I'll wait and see. Better not say anything about Eliza Hamilton. I did. <laughs> he happens to be reading the Hamilton biography when I first talked to him, and he uh, said, and I said, I'm sorry, this is not going to be a 1,000-page book, and I am not <laughs> Eliza Hamilton. <laughs> I'm sorry, I guess I get some things wrong, I don't know. Um, so I just want to say that I hope that Clayton is, is pleased that we have, have done well by him and that we are, are um, honoring him in the best way that I can think of other than the Geider Institute. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm not sure which of these is mine. Okay, it's got okay. the lipstick on. <laughs> Um, thank you, everyone. This does conclude our program today, and I want to thank everyone who worked hard to make this happen, including the Chancellor and his team, especially Annette Wetzel and Melanie Nunez, and Corey and Mike back there for their technological help, um, as well as the University of Nebraska Foundation for all their support, especially Denise Todd. Um, also, Rosemary Sikora with the University of Nebraska Press, and also J.C. Toman, who did a lot of work to put this together as well. Thank you all very much for being here, um, and I invite you to join us for a reception in the Great Hall, where Joe will be available to sign books, um, and we'll all enjoy a reception together. Thank you very much again. Thank you.